Hello everyone and welcome to the very first lesson in chemistry 1311. This is general chemistry 1 and so it's supposed to be easy. But it's only easy if you have a strong foundation in chemistry. And that's what this chapter is all about. So before you learn about the many different types of reactions and mathematical calculations in the later chapters, it's imperative that you understand what elements are what atoms are, compounds, and molecules, as well as this method called dimensional analysis. In addition, it's also important to understand physical and chemical properties, and how atoms and molecules behave in nature. In this chapter, you'll also learn about measurements and conversions, significant figures, and energy. And so yes, you have to have a strong foundation of at least this chapter in order to succeed in this class. It's important to learn about atoms and molecules because they determine how matter behaves, meaning their physical and chemical properties. And we'll talk more about matter later on in this chapter. For example, the properties of water molecules determine how water behaves. And likewise, the properties of sugar molecules determine how sugar behaves. Water behaves differently at boiling point and melting point. The water molecules in solid ice behave differently compared to those in water vapor, all because of how the molecules are arranged. In ice, the water molecules are densely close-packed and in fixed position, whereas in steam, the molecules are free to move around. Same thing is true for sugar and other molecules. So what's the difference between an atom and a molecule? Atoms are defined as the basic and simplest building blocks of matter and that they are composed of subatomic particles such as protons, electrons, and neutrons. You can have a hydrogen atom, a carbon atom, oxygen atom, and so on. Molecules on the other hand are atoms that are bonded together, meaning they are chemically stuck together to form one type of matter. Sugar is an example of a molecule. Water, caffeine, and this structure here at the bottom called tetrahydrocannabinol, aka THC. Shown here is a molecular model of a water molecule. It consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and they are all held together by a chemical bond. And you'll learn a lot more about chemical bonds in chapters 9 and 10. And this brings us to the central goal of chemistry, which is to try to understand the substances around us by first understanding the atoms and molecules that make them up. When you look closely at the molecular structure of DNA, you can see that it's composed of nucleic acids such as adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. You can easily predict that these nucleic acids can form what they call hydrogen bonds with one another. In the structure of DNA, for example, thymine forms two hydrogen bonds with adenine, whereas guanine forms three hydrogen bonds with cytosine. You can split a DNA into two strands by simply breaking these hydrogen bonds. And that, of course, takes energy. So chemistry is the science that seeks to understand the behavior of matter by studying the behavior of atoms and molecules that make them up. Here's another example of why it's important to understand the structure of atoms and molecules within a given substance. Graphite and diamond are both made up of the same element, carbon. They don't look anything alike and they both have different physical and chemical characteristics. One is brittle and the other is the hardest known material. And this is because of the way the carbon atoms are arranged and bonded together. In graphite, the carbon atoms are bonded together in 2D, two-dimensional like a piece of paper stacked on top of one another. In diamonds, the carbon atoms are bonded together and arranged in three-dimensional structure. So even slight differences in the arrangement of atoms or molecules can make a big impact on the physical and chemical characteristics of a substance. Since chemistry is a branch of science, Chemists and all other scientists follow the scientific method, which is a process for understanding nature 
by observing nature and its behavior, and by conducting experiments to test ideas. And the scientific method involves making observations, formulating hypotheses, performing experiments, and formulating laws and theories. When you hear the word observation, or the phrase make an observation, in chemistry or science in general, it doesn't necessarily mean you look at the experiment and write down what you see. When you make an observation, it can also mean you make a measurement. When you take the mass of an object, that's a measurement, which is a type of quantitative observation. When you observe that the sky is blue, that's a qualitative observation or measurement. So needless to say, observations are basically data. It can be qualitative or quantitative or numerical. Observations often lead to the formulation of hypothesis. And a hypothesis is basically your best guess, your own explanation of what you think is happening in what you just observed. Here's an example. If you didn't know what gravity was, how can you explain falling objects? You come up with a guess, and whatever that may be, that's your hypothesis. So, hypothesis is a tentative explanation of the observation. And a good hypothesis is falsifiable. It can be proven wrong. If the hypothesis was proven wrong, you can modify it and test it again. For example, Antoine Lavoisier, a French chemist, basically explained his observations on the combustion by hypothesizing that when a substance burns, it combines with a component of air. That was his hypothesis. But we now know that this component of air is oxygen. A theory is different from a hypothesis, but they are related. A theory is basically a well-established hypothesis and well accepted by the scientific community. It basically serves as a model for the way nature is and tries to explain why nature does it. Theories are validated by experiments, just like hypotheses are. Theories can never be conclusively proven because a new observation always has the potential to reveal a flaw. And you'll learn later on about Dalton's atomic theory. Some of the things that he mentioned in his theory are no longer valid today. You can also use theories to predict future observations. A scientific law is different from a theory. It's defined as a brief statement that summarizes past observations and predicts future ones. An example is the law of conservation of mass, which basically states that mass is conserved, or in a chemical reaction, matter is neither created nor destroyed. A scientific law also allows you to predict future observations, similar to a theory. However, a scientific law describes what happens but not why, whereas a theory describes how or why something happens. Here's a conceptual type of question. Which statement do you think best explains the difference between a law and a theory? Is it A, a law is truth, a theory is a mere speculation? Or is it B, a law summarizes a series of related observations, a theory gives the underlying reasons for them? Or C, a theory describes what nature does, a law describes why nature does it. And the answer is B. If you've taken physics or chemistry in high school, then you've heard most of the things we'll talk about in this chapter like matter. Matter is basically anything that occupies space, meaning volume, and has mass. Laptops, cell phones, books, and even your body are all composed of matter. And matter can be classified according to its physical state and its chemical composition. First, let's take a look at chemical composition. Matter can be classified according to its composition. Matter can be composed of elements, compounds, 
or mixtures. The first two fall under the category called pure substances, and they are, of course, different from mixtures. So in essence, matter can be categorized into either a pure substance or a mixture. A pure substance is basically made up of a single component, whereas a mixture is composed of multiple different components or substances. There are two types of pure substances. There's elements and compounds. Elements are defined as substances that cannot be chemically or physically broken down into simpler substances. Compounds, on the other hand, are substances composed of multiple different elements that are chemically stuck together in fixed definite proportions. Examples of elements are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and all of the other elements in the periodic table. Examples of compounds include water, sugar, salt, alcohols, etc. Mixtures are different from pure substances in such a way that they contain multiple different substances. There are two different types of mixtures, homogeneous and heterogeneous. The difference is really in how uniformly the substances are mixed in together. Homogeneous mixture is composed of multiple substances that appears to be just one substance. Visually, it may look like one substance, but in reality, it's a mixture of multiple different substances. Heterogeneous mixture, on the other hand, is also composed of multiple substances, except you can clearly see the different components or substances. You can tell every single one of them apart. Let's look at some examples. Sports drinks, salt water, and coffee are all examples of homogeneous mixture. They all contain multiple different substances. Sports drinks contain a mixture of water and electrolytes. Salt water contains salt and water. And coffee contains a mixture of water, caffeine, and other substances that make up its flavor. Oil and water, trail mix, and fruit salad are all examples of heterogeneous mixture because you can tell the components apart. Heterogeneous mixtures also contain solids that can sediment at the bottom over time. Sometimes this takes minutes, sometimes hours, days, and even months. These are called suspensions. Let's look at some examples here. Classify the following mixtures as either homogeneous or heterogeneous. If you want to try this on your own, you can pause this video. So the first one here, we have tea. And tea contains water, some flavors, maybe caffeine and sugar. And they all appear to be a single substance. So it looks uniform throughout and therefore homogeneous. What about tomato juice? Tomato juice contains juice extracts and some solid chunks or particles, which makes it heterogeneous. Milk contains water, vitamin D, calcium, proteins, and fats. You might think this is homogeneous, but in fact, milk is a heterogeneous mixture. And here's why. If you leave milk out for weeks or even months, solid chunks or particles will begin to sediment at the bottom. So milk is a perfect example of a suspension. Therefore, this is a heterogeneous mixture. What about carbonated drinks like sodas? They contain water, sugar, and dissolved carbon dioxide. They are homogeneous because no solids will sediment at the bottom over time. The components of a mixture, whether homogeneous or heterogeneous, can be separated. The reason is due to the different physical and chemical properties of the substances within the mixture. There are several different techniques you can use to exploit these differences and achieve separation. Some techniques are more sophisticated, accurate, and effective, but more expensive than others. A heterogeneous mixture of a solid and a liquid, like sand and water, can be separated simply by this process known as decanting. 
Decanting is a separation technique shown here that basically separates the liquid from the solid. A homogeneous mixture of liquids can be separated by a process known as distillation. The setup is shown here on the right. The idea is that the liquid mixture contains a more volatile liquid that can be evaporated out by heating. This vapor then travels through a condenser, which basically condenses that vaporized substance back into liquid and gets collected in a separate container. This is how you can separate alcohols from water. Ethanol, for example, boils at 78 degrees Celsius, whereas water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This makes ethanol the more volatile liquid and will evaporate first at lower temperatures. The third type of separation technique is called filtration. This also separates a heterogeneous mixture of solids and liquids via a filter paper. The solids get collected in the filter, whereas the liquid passes through the filter. The filter paper contains tiny little pores or holes that you can't see with the naked eye. It only allows little particles and liquids to pass through, like when you're brewing coffee. Matter can also be classified based on its physical state. There are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And there's actually a fourth one called plasma, but it doesn't exist naturally on Earth, and it's outside the scope of this class. As you already know, the state of matter depends on temperature. Solid liquefies or melts at higher temperatures, and liquid vaporizes or evaporates into vapor at even greater temperatures. Cooling results in condensation and freezing at even lower temperatures. As mentioned earlier, the atomic or molecular structure of the substance determines properties. A molecule in solid form has a different structure compared to its liquid and gas forms. And because of this, they have different properties and so they behave differently. In solids, the atoms or molecules are densely close-packed in fixed locations. They can vibrate within their location, but they are incapable of moving around. As a result, they have a fixed volume and a fixed shape. Solids can have two different atomic or molecular arrangements. They can either be crystalline or amorphous. Crystalline means the atoms or molecules have a very specific arrangement or pattern, whereas amorphous means they don't have a very specific long-range order. Table salt and diamond are both crystalline, whereas glass and plastic are both amorphous. In liquids, the atoms or molecules within the substance are free to move around. They have variable shape but fixed volume. What does it mean by fixed volume? When you transfer a gallon of water into a 10 gallon container, the volume of the water doesn't change. It's still one gallon. Liquid's ability to flow allows it to take the shape of its container. Water, alcohol, and gasoline are all substances that are liquids at room temperature. In gases, the atoms or molecules have plenty of space between them and able to move around freely, and so they have variable volume and shape. When you transfer a gallon of hydrogen gas into a 10-gallon container, the gas will take the volume of that container. Now you have a 10-gallon hydrogen gas. And when you transfer this 10-gallon gas back into the 1-gallon container, the gas now has a volume of 1 gallon. The reason is because gases can expand and compress. Here's a summary of the different states of matter and their properties. Pure substances like elements and compounds can undergo a physical change or a chemical change. A physical change results in a change in physical state or appearance, but not in its chemical composition. Water, for example, has the chemical formula H2O. When you boil water, it turns into steam, and steam is still water just in gas form. 
In other words, it's still H2O. Its chemical composition never changed. Melting and vaporizing are both examples of a physical change. Freezing and condensing are also examples of a physical change. And so are sublimation and deposition. Sublimation, by definition, is when a solid turns directly into gas, bypassing the liquid state. Deposition is the opposite of sublimation. This is when a gas turns directly into solid, also bypassing the liquid state. Chemical change, on the other hand, is more common in chemical reactions. This involves the change in chemical composition. Rusting is an example of a chemical change. When iron is exposed to oxygen in the air, a chemical reaction occurs, which results in the formation of iron oxide, which is completely different from iron. Combustion or burning is another example of a chemical change. When you burn wood, it turns into ashes, which means you've completely changed its composition. It's no longer wood. Tarnishing of silver is another example. Chemical change is involved in every chemical reaction. How do we know a chemical reaction took place? There are four indicators of a chemical reaction. The first one is generation of gas. Production of gas bubbles is a strong indication of a chemical reaction. For example, when a metal is dissolved in an acid, it produces hydrogen gas, and this tells us that there was a chemical reaction. The second one is the formation of a solid precipitate. When you mix two liquids together and that produces solid particles, you have a chemical reaction. So when you mix lead nitrate and potassium iodide, for example, this produces a yellow precipitate known as lead iodide. When there's a permanent change in color, you have a chemical reaction. pH indicators change color depend, depending on the acidity or basicity of the liquid solution. And finally, a change in the overall energy is a good indicator of a chemical reaction. When you mix two liquids together and it turns hot, that means energy was released in the form of heat. Substances exhibit both physical and chemical properties, and these are things that you can measure and observe. A physical property is a measurable property that a substance exhibits without affecting its chemical composition. For example, you can determine the color of a substance without changing its chemical composition. You can determine the scent or smell of a substance without ca causing any chemical change. You can also measure the melting point and boiling point of a substance without inducing any change in composition. A chemical, a chemical property, on the other hand, is a measurable property that results in the change in the substance's chemical composition. Flammability is a perfect example of a chemical property. In order to know whether something is flammable, you, ha you have to light it on fire and burn it. Once you've burned it, you have already changed its composition. So in other words, a chemical property is only observable and measurable if there's a chemical reaction. Determine the following whether it's a physical property or a chemical property. Pause the video if you want to give it a shot. So you just learned earlier that one, one of the four indicators of a chemical reaction or a chemical change is the change in energy. But what is energy? Energy is basically the capacity to do work. Without energy, you can't perform work. And work is essentially the action of a force through a distance. And this is something that you can quantify. Someone who has pushed a box through a certain distance has performed work. There's a lot of different types of energy, but the two main types are kinetic and potential energy. 
Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. A car traveling 100 miles per hour has a higher kinetic energy than the same car going 50 miles per hour because it's going a lot faster. Potential energy, on the other hand, is stored energy or energy associated with position. So a rock on top of a hill has a higher potential energy compared to the same rock already on the ground. That rock with high potential energy can roll down the hill, converting potential into kinetic energy. Something that's unstable has high potential energy and something that's stable has low potential energy. So that's the relationship, relationship between potential energy and stability. Thermal energy is a perfect example of kinetic energy. This is the energy associated with temperature. The hotter the object is, the greater its thermal energy. Thermal energy is basically the result of individual particles in motion. One example of potential energy, which is stored energy, is basically chemical energy. So this is the energy stored in chemicals. Another thing that you might want to remember is the law of conservation of energy. So this law basically states that energy is conserved. It is neither created nor destroyed. Systems with high potential energy tend to change in a direction that lowers their potential energy by releasing energy into the surroundings. So the molecules, for example, in gasoline, uh, the active ingredients in gasoline are ethanol and octane. So they're both carbon-based molecules. They are considered unstable because they can undergo chemical reactions like combustion reaction. So when you burn these molecules, they turn into more stable molecules like carbon dioxide and water. So what this means is that the potential energy of the molecules in gasoline is a lot higher compared to the potential energy of the molecules in the exhaust. And so because we have to follow the law of conservation of energy, in which energy is conserved, the total potential energy before the combustion reaction has to equal the potential energy after the combustion. And so energy is released into the surroundings after the combustion reaction.